Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, where we explore the history and the reliability of the Bible. I'm your host, Henry Smith. In two previous episodes called Ape Men and Adam, Dr. Todd Wood gave us a tour of evidence from the world of early humanity. Today, he returns to provide us with an update on his human origins research. Todd is a PhD in biochemistry, and he's the president of the CORE Academy of Science. Well, Dr. Wood, welcome back to Digging for Truth. It's good to see you again. Yeah, it's great to see you again, Henry. How have you been? Well, I'm doing well and uh, uh, just thankful thankful to the Lord for uh, another great day of life. Uh, and yeah. we get to, get to sit you and I together and talk about uh, early origins of humanity. Fascinating uh, topic. Before we dive into uh, the nature of our subject today, um, I, I was hoping that you could uh, just uh, give uh, this, the audience a little bit of a tutorial, if you will, about Core Academy of Science, what you do, why you do it. Sure. Uh, our ministry is uh, dedicated to nurturing the next generation of faithful Christ-like creation researchers to explore the hardest problems in creation. So, we're basically interested in helping students out who are trying to become creation researchers, creation scientists, creation scholars. So we have a number of programs that we that we sponsor that uh, connect with students and connect students with other scholars who are already established in the field and help those uh, students to learn the skills that they need in addition to just being scientists, but to how to think faithfully and thoughtfully and intentionally about about the questions that are raised in the world of creation research. Well, that's fantastic. When I first heard about your your ministry, I was just I just thought it was fantastic because you know uh, much of the scientific enterprise on origins today is of course done in an evolutionary worldview paradigm context, and so we need to raise up an entire new generation of researchers and students to uh, you know, develop the creation model of origins. Now, in, in your uh, description of your ministry, you mentioned the, quote, hardest problems of creation. And so speaking of hardest problems, or uh, an, a yeah. very fascinating and enigmatic and mysterious discovery we're gonna explore today is um, Homo naledi. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put that out there and let you uh, lay that out, begin to lay that out for the audience. Sure, yeah. So back in 2013, uh, some cavers working in uh, South Africa, about a half an hour from Johannesburg, north of Johannesburg, uh, have dug into this pretty well-known cave, the Rising Star Cave there, and found bones lying on the surface uh, of the cave floor. And they were working for a paleontologist named uh, Lee Berger, who is at the University of the Vatashran there. And Lee knew from the pictures that they brought to him that he had, that they had found something really, really important and really exciting. And it turned out, yeah, it is the richest site of hominin fossils in the entire continent of Africa. Uh, they have sort of doubled the number of hominin if you don't count homo sapiens if you just count the other hominin fossils known from south africa they doubled it in a matter of a year the number that were known um so this was a big deal and these creatures uh they're short they're 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 small they're shorter and smaller than we are uh, they have hands and feet that are kind of like ours, um, but their shoulders and arms are more different. Okay. <laughs> They're very different from what we are. So very unusual discovery and, a, and an absolute, you know, talk about striking gold. I mean, they, they really struck gold with that. Yeah, so it's a paleontologist's dream is what it sounds like. Yeah, okay. definitely. Now, you mentioned two things. You mentioned Homo sapiens, which is the classification we use for modern human beings and others, uh, close an, uh, ancestors, uh, but use the term homonym. Let's, let's uh, talk about that a little bit, uh, about the meaning of that and how scientists use that term. Well, a, a scientist would use it in the sense of something that's more closely related evolutionarily to 
modern human beings than it is to a chimpanzee. Uh, when I use it, I use it to refer to the class of apes and people who have the sort of adaptations that you would expect to see in something that walked around on two legs. Okay. Now we can't, you know, we can't know for a hundred percent sure that these, these creatures all walked around on two legs, but we can see certain features of the skeleton, certain features that are in both the backbone and the skull and the hips and the legs and so forth that would all be the sorts of things we would expect from a creature that walks around on two legs. Okay, so we're talking about uh, a cave that's deep in the ground. Yep. Uh, if I understand this right, uh, the uh, quite deep, uh, almost three quarters of the length of a football field. Is that is that correct, Todd? I think that's right. Yeah, it's okay. quite deep. It's it's a long. So for the for the professional cavers, just to get down to where the bones began, it was a forty five minute journey in the dark right so it was a long trip down there and you imagine you know somebody like me who has never been in a cave before I, well i i wouldn't even fit in there but anyway yeah <laughs> it would be a much longer journey for people like me <laughs> okay so if you could describe um sort of generally the the volume of the bones and sort of the state yeah. that state that they were sort of in and we got about a minute for that okay quickly then thousands of bones in this cave i got a few of them here here's a piece of a skull this is the uh this is the orbit where the eye would be uh so this is parietal and frontal bones there uh, i've got a piece of the occipital bone here uh and these are models these are three-dimensional scans of the original fossils uh and so these are true to size and true to form of how they were discovered. So this would be some of what was found. And then there were others, but yeah, thousands of bones. Uh, and the, the original excavation basically took off what was on the surface and a little bit uh, down into the, the sediments um, in a very localized location. And so since then, there have been additional uh, discoveries. And so, yes, the, the number of actual individual bones is now in the thousands. Okay, so uh, uh, one of the things you mentioned that the evidence points to, you can make a quick comment about this and then we'll go to break. Um, okay. Are the, are the bones pulled apart? Are they disarticulated? What, what's the general state of them? Both, right? So like I said, here, here's a piece of a skull, right? So that's not a full skull. Uh, but on the other hand, you find things like this, right? Here's a complete hand. Well, not a complete hand. There's one wrist bone missing, but otherwise it's a complete hand. Right. Uh, and it was found in articulation. So we know that this is actually a hand from an individual uh, homo naledi uh, person. So uh, yeah, that that's, that's this is amazing preservation. Really okay. amazing stuff. All right. Well, uh, we're going to talk more about that. We're going to we're just setting the stage here for for this discussion. And friends, thank you for joining us for digging for truth. We'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. I'm here with Dr. Todd Wood, and we're talking about a very unique hominin that's been discovered in South Africa called Homo naledi. Now, Todd, uh, you were showing that uh, pristinely uh, preserved hand of, yeah. of this person or creature or, or, yeah. or, or, you know, that's part of the subject of debate. Uh, you mentioned in, your, in the previous segment very short, um, different kind of shoulders and that kind of thing. So some people might be saying, well, wait, that sounds like an ape-like kind of creature. <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't sound human, but it gets more complicated than that. Uh, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, sure. So 
So the original, uh, the original excavations put together a composite skull that looks like this. Um, so it's, as you can see, small compared to my, to my cranium. Um, uh, yeah, so quite a small brain, uh, but a face that, you know, he's got, he's definitely got a nose here like we would have. He, he uh, I could imagine this fellow uh, yeah, I can imagine this looking like other things in the fossil record that I'm familiar with, uh, that are that are that I think are human. Uh, here's um, another. Uh, this is a male skull uh, called Neo that was found in the same cave system, um, and again, quite tiny, uh, but again, quite different. Right, so there's no real forehead to speak of. Like we have a big high forehead that's not there, uh, and the mouth does tend to to stick out a bit more. Uh, than it does uh, with us. So, but the thing about these fossils that made them so, I think, astonishing and and I think controversial was the the idea that that the bodies of these individuals had been deliberately placed in this cave. That this was not a natural accumulation. That somebody had intentionally dragged these bodies down there and put them there. So, yeah, uh, and part of the reasoning for, for, that, for that argument was that one of the things that you find down there is just bones of Homo naledi. You don't really find, I mean, there's a couple of other things. There's a, there's a bit of a baboon skeleton in one spot, and there's a, some what appear to be owl and mouse bones uh, that have also been recovered. But for the most part, for thousands and thousands of bones, they're all one kind of a thing. They're all homo naledi, uh, which is unusual. The location is, as we've already mentioned, very inaccessible, deeply, uh, deeply found in this in the back of this cave in a in a location called the Dinaledi Chamber, uh, that is in the deep dark recesses of the cave, and very hard to imagine how. You know, this many individuals, at least 17 individuals, uh, got lost and got, and, and got stuck in this, in this location. Right. Plus, there seems to be evidence that this was used over time, that, that the bodies are in different states of articulation. So there are some bodies that were pretty well articulated and other bodies that were poorly articulated. And that would suggest that that there had been bodies put there, they had decomposed and the bones had disarticulated and then more bodies had been brought in and put on top. Uh, all of which suggests that, well, they don't, I don't know anything else that looks like that in the fossil record. I might be naive about that, but it, it, it and uninformed, but, but it seems to me quite unique and calls for a very un, uh, an unusual <laughs> explanation. And intentionally burying these individuals seems to be the best, the best way to explain it all. So when we think about intentional burial, I think, I think uh, audience members can follow, follow the sort of logic of where you're heading with this is, I, I guess maybe the question, I should reverse the, the question a little bit. Um, this, is, this seems like human activity, something human beings would do. And, and then we're lacking an analogy in the animal kingdom of animals engaging in repeated deliberate burial. Now, uh, let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, yeah. Right? Uh, that, that's yeah. where your thinking is on that. It's, it's, it's kind of tricky, right? So we don't, I, I have to note here, these, these are anatomically different from us. These are not modern humans, whatever they are. Um, so it's not like you can just say, well, they buried their dead like we do. Yeah, maybe. Um, and but at the same time, and we don't find them with with any artifacts or, you know, jewelry or decorations or tools or anything like that. Uh, we just so far, I should say, we, we just have the bodies. Um, but yeah, they're deep in this cave. They're way back there in the dark. So that suggests that whoever was putting them back there must have had controlled use of fire, right? They must have had some kind of light to be able to get them back in there. Uh, and the idea that they're continually doing this, 
is also very suggestive. That's that's the sort of thing you do when you're sort of remembering who's there, right? You could imagine, for example, an animal, a really clever animal figuring out, you know, if I take this rotting corpse away from where I sleep, it will attract fewer predators to my sleeping den. Uh, so I could imagine that that might be something an ape, a really clever ape might figure out. Um, but the fact that they keep going back to the same place over possibly generations uh, suggests that they remember who they put there. They remember that this is important. That's, that's a much more human uh, behavior. And combine that with the idea that they, I can't imagine how they got down there without any light. You start to think, okay, well, this is starting to look like human behavior and not just uh, an animal who is clever enough to to get rid of the dead bodies from his sleeping den. All right, so so we're outside the box here. Uh, yeah, we're we're, at, we're outside the box because we we have what could be human human uh, that don't look a, that look quite different than modern humans. Um, uh, but we need to explore more of that as, as we walk through the, into our next segment, Todd. So we're going to go to a break, and then we're going to keep uh, walking through the evidence and see where it leads us. And friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm here with Dr. Todd Wood. We're talking about mysterious creatures called Homo naledi found in the cave in South Africa. Are they human? And are they perhaps ancestors related to us? Well, we're going to keep exploring that. Uh, Dr. Wood, okay. So two key pieces of evidence that you, that you see here, uh, the depth of the cave, uh, no way stuff could have gotten washed in there, the need for fire to get in the cave, and then the repeated bringing of these bodies in. Just sort of uh, talk about that a little bit more. It's interesting in science, by the way, I just add this. These are inferences that you're making, but it's hard to escape from the logic of these inferences. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think it's important to, to remember that, you know, this is still ongoing research, and this this could change. We could change our minds, and we could we could discover new things that would change the way we read and interpret this evidence. But as far as we understand it now, as far as what has been reported to us, there are no other entrances to that, to that particular chamber in the cave, except by going down this treacherous path. Um, and so, yeah, it's hard to imagine how so many individuals over such a period of time could have wandered into that cave and gotten lost and died there unless they were intentionally put there. Usually when you find an accumulation of bodies in a cave like that, it's because there was a sinkhole above, right? And it was an opening to the surface right. that wasn't apparent. Right. And so you just wander in and oops, there you are, now you're dead. Um, but that does not seem to be what's happening here. There does not seem to be any opening other than going all the way through the cave. The other thing that was really interesting last fall, they reported the discovery of a, of a juvenile skull or pieces of a juvenile skull uh, in a passageway that was uh, a good 30 feet, 33 feet away from, about 10 meters away from the original um, excavations. And it required another treacherous journey over fallen rock and down this really narrow pathway. And they found this, the remains of this skull on a little ledge. Um, and the only way, you know, they could imagine how that got there would be that somebody was in there at some time in the past, 
found the tiny little baby skull or juvenile skull and took it down that passageway and put it on that shelf, um, which again implies, to me, it implies that the individuals doing that had some maybe affection for this juvenile skull. Yes. Maybe they thought that it was special in some way and deserved to be put aside from the other bodies that were there. Um, all of this sort of behavior, you know, you come back to it and you think about how we approach mourning and grieving and death and the sorts of things that you see happening in this in this cave remind me a lot of the way uh, human beings would approach death. Okay, so uh, one of the things I love about your ministry and the, and the way that you pursue scientific research is, you know, you got to be honest about the evidence. You got to you got to think outside the box. So some, some implications that could flow out of this, and please comment on this then. All right, uh, let's say these are human. They look quite different than us. Uh, so, so maybe somebody watching is going to say, wait a minute, are you saying that we evolved from lower life forms? Because you and I both believe in a historical Adam, that the scriptures are right about that. Right. Um, and then the second part of that, so if you comment on that, and then the other part of it is thinking outside the box, and you've done a great job of helping me with this, is what ancient humans look like may look different. So humanity may not look the same as we yeah. think it is. It may be a wider view of yeah. the physical attributes. So please yeah. uh, go yeah. ahead with those. Those are great points. So, so on the first point, no, I am definitely not saying that humanity evolved from lesser or lower life forms like apes and chimpanzees or whatever. All of those ideas, you can put that right out of your mind. These, these individuals are either uh, human or they're not human. That is my perspective. They fit into one of those categories. And as far as I can tell from my own analysis of the shape of these, of these fossils based on the digital scans that are available to the public, um, these are these robustly and routinely cluster together with other people that I understand to be human. So on, in terms of the, the, the appearance of these creatures, they may look different from us, but they do seem to be persistently grouping with other things that I would say are human. So these are human, they are not animals, they are not missing links, they are not in between things, they're human. But they definitely look different, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, I can't get away from that. And so that's one of the questions that people wanna know, well, where did they come from? And I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think we're still, I think in terms of just understanding what makes a person look the way they do, we're still in the very early stages of understanding that. What are the sorts of developmental processes that give us our attributes? What are the genetic uh, cues that turn on and turn off and allow us to grow the sorts of features that we do? We're, we're just starting to really understand that we've we've only just begun that process and so you know what what we we hardly know what causes us to look the way we do and it's hard to say then what would cause uh what would cause a different shape altogether yes. what, how would this then end up being uh a human as well so so there's op those are open questions and those are some of those hard questions that i like to talk about you know how how do we understand this and how does it all fit together? Uh, but I definitely think they're human. I definitely think they are descended from Adam and Eve. They are made in the image of God. I suspect at this point, uh, given the fact that they're found in a cave like this, that they are probably living after the flood. Uh, so this is a descendant of Noah as well. Uh, yeah, all of those pieces then go into the puzzle of trying to figure out where do these guys come from and how did they end up so different and how did they end up, you know, where they are and so far away from uh, the, the Ark landing location there in, in the mountains of, of Ararat. Right. Those are all open questions and fantastic questions. And I can't wait to, I can't wait to learn more. 
Well, keep doing the good work. Uh, believe it or not, we've we've come down to the end, Todd. Uh, ah. And I know, I know, we, it felt like we were just getting started. So let's have you back on the show to talk about the next phase of the research of these, the next time you've got some new information. Thanks for coming on and thanks for all you do. Thank you. Well, friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. The pursuit of science and truth uh, is an open question for us as Christians. Uh, we should not be afraid of the evidence we can trust in God's revelation, what he's told us about the past and study and do science within the context of that and uh, determine the truth of these things that we dig up from the ancient past. And thank you for joining us today for Digging for Truth. <music>